So uh, I'd like to focus on this presentation on the role of defense and, and security forces and thwarting, uh, you know, militant groups and insurgencies from becoming entrenched within local communities. And I would like to focus it on a particular region, which is the coastal West Africa. So, <clears throat> but as those familiar with the literature on how do we counter militant groups, uh, how do we counter insurgencies? As those who are familiar with the literature know, <clears throat> military and law enforcement forces, you know, can also abet the growth of, you know, militant insurgent movements. When we have weak, <clears throat> ill-prepared, or predatory defense and security forces, th those can feed uh, an insurgency. They can feed its momentum <clears throat> as well as the perception uh, of government weakness and government corruption. So to be sure, as, as Daisy laid out very nicely, uh, dysfunctional defense and security forces, what I'll be referring to as DSF, are not the main reasons that violent militant actors emerge. The contributing factors, as Daisy laid out, of violent militancy, you know, have much to do <clears throat> with a vacuum in state authority, in dysfunctional governance, and in indiscriminate repression. Yet, yet, weak military forces and dysfunctional internal security and intelligence mechanisms, they help insurgents gain footholds. So in these contexts, contexts like this, what needs to be done? Well, we know that countries that have undertaken, you know, early and deliberate actions to restructure their defense and security forces, you know, they have, <clears throat> uh, you know, somewhat succeeded in transforming these forces from enablers of militant insurgencies into key pillars, right, in helping stem <clears throat> these violent insurgencies. So such a process necessitates more than just expanding the size of these forces, more than just improving the weapons of the defense and security forces, right? As the literature on countering militant armed groups and militancies stresses, DSF, again, defense and security forces, cannot play an effective role in helping thwart a militant insurgency without undergoing serious changes to their doctrine, to their structure, to their approach, and of course to their capabilities. Right? So when five areas emerge as particularly critical in any efforts to reform defense and security forces, their posture, and their capabilities, namely the expansion. Well, you need to expand the size of, you know, if you have a military force that is 5,000, well. So expansion is important, professionalization of the forces and specialization of these forces, as well as enhancement of the interagency working together, coordination, and finally DSF community relations. Where does the community fit in all of this? So enhancing these reforms does not, of course, guarantee success in countering violence, militancy, right? Reforms, all of these reforms are important, but they can only be effective if accompanied uh, by progress in improving institutional capacities, creating economic, obviously, opportunity, strengthening social cohesion, advancing access to justice, and earnestly exploring dialogue and negotiations as conflict resolution tools. All right. So this presentation will discuss the role of you know, defense and security for the role that they can play or they do play, like in successful cases, somewhat like Cote d'Ivoire elsewhere, in combating nascent uh, militant insurgencies, like those affecting today coastal West Africa, Benin, Togo, <coughs> Cote d'Ivoire, <coughs> you know, Ghana, etc. So I'll try to offer uh, broad tenets that DSF, Defense Security Forces, and their organizations should take into account as they hone 
and as they deepen the reforms already launched in all of these countries, right? Reforms to do what? To enhance the operational effectiveness of these forces, <clears throat> but also to enhance the legitimacy of these forces. So how do you roll back militant insurgencies, right? <clears throat> Thwarting incipient insurgencies like those we see in Benin, Togo, etc., you know, necessitates that first threatened governments make a candid, honest effort, first to know themselves and then to know their adversaries. Right, this is one of the most important principles in countering insurgency. Governments that conduct truthful assessments of their strengths and their weaknesses, right, and invest in understanding their adversaries, their capabilities. What are the motives of your adversary? What are the capability of your adversary? What are the strategies that the adversary use to control and expand, right? Those are the countries that are in a better position to design and implement effective responses, right? So the primacy of honest <coughs> self-assessment, the primacy of honest threat appraisal correlates strongly with the second principle, which is key to prevailing over militant insurgents, right? And that's political primacy. All reform actions must be planned and conducted with the goal of not only filling counterinsurgency capability gaps. That's important to do, obviously, right? But also improving, as I said earlier, government legitimacy, trying to improve confidence with deeply aggrieved communities, legitimate grievances these communities have, as Daisy said. You know, most don't join because of, you know, radical ideology. So the entire government from the top <coughs> political military like we have in this room and law enforcement leaders down to the front line, uh, soldiers, policemen, gendarmes, public service, all of these, they must do their parts in building trust with local populations. I mean, after all, the cornerstone of any counterinsurgency is to mend the broken social contract with disaffected communities. Because these are the, often the lifeblood of militant insurgencies. So the third <coughs> principle calls for improving the synergy of intervention <coughs> among all of these actors, right, encountering, that are engaged in countering militant groups, militant insurgencies. Because at its core, the essence of a collaborative partnership-based approach to countering militant insurgency resides in inclusivity, in dialogue and trust between security actors, local authorities, and local communities, particularly those that are most exposed to vulnerability and violence. Until very recently, as Daisy you know, stated, Counter-militancy provi practices provided little engagement with local authorities, little engagement with communities. You know, is that state actors, defense and security forces, they seldom take into account the diverse, <coughs> thank you, the diverse needs, uh, concerns, and the perceptions of local communities of local authority. So these three principles of counterinsurgency, they set the stage, right, for some specific imperatives, right, that must be kept in mind in context of trying to contain, trying to prevent, right, trying to thwart these budding insurgencies like we're seeing in coastal West Africa. First is the critical role of the police and law enforcement, and I'm happy to see some in my discussion groups really brilliant minds coming from, you know, that service. Uh, so much of the literature, if you read about counterinsurgency, they talk about the role of the military, which is important, obviously, right? But little attention is focused on the functions of policing in counter counterinsurgency operations. <clears throat> so the key turning point in trying to curtail a budding Militant insurgency comes with first early and determined state efforts to enhance the capacity and the presence of these security forces, the police, gendarmes, you know, 
uh, forest agents. So in this respect, developing and calibrating the capabilities of law enforcement agencies, such as the police, such as gendarmerie, these are the paramilitary national police force, such as forest rangers, through those things that I identified. Force expansion is very important, professionalization, specialization, all of these are key requirements. Right? Why? Because they make the actions of the police and law enforcement more proportional, more discriminate, more effective. So these modernization steps must be integrated in the broader government efforts to build public confidence in the police, in the gendarme, in other law enforcement you know, agencies uh, here, right? By improving the levels of their service delivery. Because actions by the police, by the gendarmerie, by the forest rangers that improve security, that improve livelihood opportunities are the most effective way to demonstrate to local communities that the state is determined to meet its responsibilities, that the state is determined to win, to prevail over militant insurgents. But again, attaining this outcome requires that government make an honest effort to build not only capabilities, which is important, <clears throat> but also the legitimacy of these forces. Because the legitimacy effectiveness relationship, right, is paramount. Why is it important? I mean, it's not just it's a moral thing to, to do, to treat people well, right? It's paramount because you need to uh, produce actionable intelligence information. So when you have capable law enforcement that are population-centric, when you have the police, you know, the, the gendarmes and others that are able to coordinate with the military and with other specialized units, all of this makes them a force multiplier in any effort to nip a militant insurgency in the bud. So, indeed, the literature, when you read the literature, and the practitioners obviously know this, when you try to counter, you know, militant insurgencies, the literature identifies, again, I'm repeating myself here, force professionalization, functional specialization and coordination between the forces here, right? Because that's critical to intelligence gathering and analysis. <clears throat> that's critical to population protection. And that's also critical to kinetic operations. These capabilities, however, are often lacking at the onset of insurgencies, including the ones plaguing coastal West African states today, right? And there are many cases where dysfunctional, as Daisy said, and abusive internal securities have fed the momentum of these incipient militant insurgencies. As documented in the Central Sahel, early failures by weak and unprepared police and gendarmes and others to tackle criminality and to tackle insurgent intimidation alienated local communities and exacerbated instability here. So the police and law enforcement agencies have a role to play. And as we are seeing today in Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, and Togo, and, and others, all of these countries, their forces are undergoing reforms with regard to their structure, with regard to their approach, and with regard to their duties. So in all of these countries, what we're seeing today, and we're lucky that we have expertise in the room, right, to fill in, obviously, those gap and to share with us where things are working and where things are not working and they stand to improve. Obviously, that's the purpose of this, you know, uh, workshop here, here today. So all of these forces, they, have in, they are working on increasing the size of their forces, the specialization in their functions, the improvement in their professionalism. Obviously, the scale and components of these reforms, they differ from context to context, obviously, right? But the patterns of reforms, you know, they show many commonalities, whether it's Togo, whether it's Benin, whether it's Cote d'Ivoire, whether it's elsewhere, right? Uh, Cote d'Ivoire, we don't need to go into the details here. We don't have the time. Cote d'Ivoire is one of the, uh, you know, relatively successful, obviously, cases, and it will be interesting to see what's working there and, and, and what's not wor working. Um, but, uh, so we don't need to go into the, the case, because I know... <coughs> Minutes. Okay. So in any case, all of these reforms are hard to pull, to pull though, right? 
because they require more than just improving the operational effectiveness of security agencies, but also you know, enhancing their political legitimacy through reducing human rights abuses, through reducing corruption within the midst of the police, within the midst you know, of the gendarmerie, within the midst of the military, obviously, as well. So legitimizing policing and military functions also require reforms in other sectors, especially, and I see Kat here, in the justice, right? Uh, she's the rule of law guru, so she knows much better than, than me here. So, uh, but but it, this is hard to accomplish, as we see in, in several cases, where also in, in coastal West Africa, in which we still have undeveloped and reformed courts and corrections, right? And these are, when you see the African barometer, uh, you know, the least uh, trusted institutions. Uh, that's, that's a problem. You know, as one of the experts I, I met in the continent, he said, look, when people see the police and they run away from them, you've got a problem. You're not going to defeat an insurgency. <laughs> and even if you do, I mean, it will pop up again in different forms, as, 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 as we know, right? So the third imperative is strengthening the institutionalization of the interagency process here. Again, as stressed in the literature, if to neutralize, especially these insurgencies that are still emerging today, right? It requires intensive cooperation between political security, justice sectors, as well as the ministries uh, and, and local agencies that are tasked with extending state services into the territories that are vulnerable to insurgents. The fourth imperative is building communities of trust. That, that's really the core of it here, right? Because building communities of trust between DSF, Defense and Security Forces, and local populations is critical. It's a critical component of DSF efforts to counter militant groups, right? Yet the overall, as you know, the overall relationship is often fraught with misunderstandings between the forces and the people, misperceptions and mistrust. The good news is that in this case, in West Coast of West Africa, even in, in the room here, you know, if you talk to colleagues, most are cognizant of the paramount importance of investing in building trust between DSF and local communities. And when you look at the, what these countries are doing, whether it's Côte d'Ivoire, you know, Benin, Togo, Ghana, they have all adopted political, legislative, and operational frameworks to improve the synergy of intervention between DSF civil society organizations, populations, and local authorities here, right? Um, so in Cote d'Ivoire, as an example, there is a growing number of cooperation mechanisms and platforms for dialogue between these actors, security actors, local authorities, local populations, civil society, and other relevant state. Or, you know, Cote d'Ivoire, you have the civil military cells, you have the ethics advisory committees, you have the departmental security committees, these departmental security committees, they assemble les gouvernes, the les préfets, the, pre, the, the prefects, uh, municipal authorities, youth leaders, community representatives. So all of these, they play a critical role in uh, building trust and cooperation between DSF and local communities, right? Through sensitizing the populations, you know, to security issues, as well as mediating conflicts, right? So in Benin, say, same thing. Again, we don't need to go into, into the details here, right? Togo, same thing again. So all of these, and I'll wrap up. You've been very patient with me, Mr. Moderator. So thank you. Apologize. I always do this to him. And, right. So. <laughs> so in all coastal West African states affected by the threats of militant insurgency, collaborative security approaches to security have emerged as an important complement to traditional military and law enforcement responses. Yet, despite the progress, and the progress is real, right? It's real. So they are making efforts. Uh, and we have a case to learn from, obviously, the Sahel, because we don't want to go to West Africa in five years or, uh, to be the case. That's not what, what, what we want, obviously. So the implementation process has been uh, complicated. It's hard. And again, I'm, I'm going to look to the experts here. I can't wait to go back to the discussion groups. So walk me through this and, and colleagues, right? Uh, why? Because it demands not only, it's not just about engaging populations, which is important in the problem solving, but, 
but to engage the communities, you need first to reform yourself. All of these forces, right? You need to not only adopt, but implement sound changes in the structures of these forces, in the management styles, right? Within defense, security, and relevant government. That's why it's hard, because everybody now talk about, well, let's build trust, which is good. Everybody realize it's important, right? But why? Why is it still, it's still lacking, right? Because it requires, obviously, internal reforms, and as you know, the poli it's a complex process, but it can be. It, 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 can, it can be done. So I'll stop right here. Thank you for your patience with me. Thank you, Mr. Moderator.